Welcome everyone. My name is Paige and you are here to learn a little bit about some of the pagan origins of our holidays. Uh, we're very grateful that you're joining us today and of course we are grateful for our presenter tonight. Chaz S. Clifton holds degrees from Reed College and the University of Colorado. After spending the 1980s as a journalist, he taught at Colorado State University Pueblo until 2008. Since then, he has concentrated on academic writing and editing. He was formerly co-chair of the Contemporary Pagan Studies Group within the American Academy of Religion, and he edits The Pomegranate, the International Journal of Pagan Studies, a peer-reviewed journal from Equinox Publishing in the United Kingdom. Jess, thank you so much for being here tonight. We are very grateful to have you. I'm going to go ahead and turn the program over to you. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Paige. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Um, and by the way, I'm sitting in a little cabin in the wet mountains in southern Colorado, and it's still a bit chilly, so I'm going to have to keep my sweater and hat on, I think, <laughs> until the heat comes up. Um, so I was asked to speak on the pagan origins of Christmas, or whether or not the Christians stole the celebration of Christmas from pagan culture. This question has historical, theological, and political dimensions. It carries with it not just tensions between Christianity and contemporary forms of paganism in the West, such as Wicca, Druidry, Asatru, Heathenry, and others, but also between tensions between Christianity and the secular world. I was driving in the city of Pueblo today, and sure enough, there was one of those Keep Christ and Christmas billboards on a major viaduct. There's also been tension within Christianity over the celebration of Christmas. When to celebrate it, how to celebrate it, and even whether or not to celebrate it. For instance, if you were to argue that Christmas is essentially pagan, you would be pretty much in line with those 17th century Puritans in England and New England who completely ignored it on the grounds that it was polluted by pagan-ish Roman Catholic customs. Now, the idea of Christians, quote, stealing the solstice was voiced a lot in the 18th and 19th centuries. Edward Gibbon's big history, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, was published in six volumes between 1776 and 1788. It had an anti-Christian bias because this was the time in history when intellectuals who previously never would have questioned Christian claims began to do that. Anyway, Gibbon blamed the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West on Christian influence. And his was the history that everybody read, all educated English speakers who studied that read Gibbon. And, um, and of course it was widely translated elsewhere. He portrayed Christianity as intolerant and Roman pagan religions as tolerant, a view that's still widely accepted, although historians continue to debate whether or not Christians were persecuted, or excuse me, whether or not pagans were persecuted and just how much. In fact, that we're even talking about this is kind of a tribute to Gibbon. So anyway, what I'm gonna do here is start with the Christian history of Christmas, which may seem a little backwards, but bear with me. Um, I, I am in the long run more concerned with contemporary pagan practice than with what happened centuries ago. I will touch on some of the common secularized symbols of Christmas, such as Christmas trees and Santa Claus, and the claims people make about those and about their origins. And I'll have a little bit to say about how your pagan neighbors today celebrate the season. First of all, let's take a quick run through the gospel story. Okay, it's generally accepted by Bible scholars that the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are date from about 100 years after the events they describe. And um, of the gospels, Mark is the oldest, but it starts with an adult Jesus um, meeting the prophet known as John the Baptist, who according to Luke was Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist also appears at the beginning of the gospel attributed to John the Apostle, so there's no birth story there. The, Christian, the Christmas story we're used to hearing is a blending uh, mashup of the stories given in Matthew and Luke. The first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew is mostly given over to genealogy, trying to connect Jesus a thousand years back to King David. 
but it also includes the story of the three wise men or the wise men from the East who come to King Herod, who's the Jewish puppet king under the Roman Empire, asking, where is he that was born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the East and are come to worship him. And of course, if you remember the story, you know that Herod's thinking, wait a minute, I'm the king of the Jews. Who are you talking about? And when he learns they're talking about a baby, he orders supposedly, according to the story, the slaughter of all male babies called the massacre of the innocents. But anyway, there's problems right there from a historical standpoint. And that's why one of the reasons we know that this story is not written at the time it happened. It's kind of like someone trying to remember what happened 100 years ago in American history without having access to newspapers or to the library reference desk or even to Wikipedia. Um, the wise men from the East, well, maybe they came from Persia. Uh, it kind of sounds that way, like they're Zoroastrians. But anyway, King Herod. King Herod's a real person. Like I say, he's a Jewish prince. Made, he's a client king or puppet king of the Roman province, which means basically that as long as he sends in the tax revenue to Rome, he can, get to, he can go on being king. Um, he was born around 74 BCE. And um, he was actually a fairly ambitious king. He uh, did a lot of civic pro projects, and kept the peace. But he apparently died around the year 4 BC. And immediately his kingdom was divided among his children. But Augustus, the Roman Empire, decided that they were untrustworthy and incompetent. And um, unlike Herod, who was, you know, what the mafia would call a good earner. And so um, Augustus decided to send in a professional Roman governor, a guy named Quirinus. So anyway, um, um, everything else in the story of Christmas comes from Luke. And that includes the story of the Annunciation, the angel telling Mary that she's carrying the Messiah, and the famous verse saying that Augustus ordered a census when Quirinus was governor and everyone had to go to his own town to be registered. The babies laid in the manger because Joseph and Mary can't find a room to rent. And a lot of the houses back then, you know, had people on the second floor and animals on the ground floor. Too. So if there was no room in the people space, you ended up in the animal space. Um, and it has the stories of the angels appearing to the shepherds who are out in the field with their flocks at night. We'll get back to that. But there's no wise men. Okay, so first of all, the chronology doesn't work. It'd be like an American saying, during World War I, when Theodore Roosevelt was president, which is wrong because Roosevelt was pre not president anymore by the time of World War I, it was 10 years earlier, although he was alive then. Secondly, this is more important, there was no census per se. In other words, the Roman census was not one of these things where they're counting people. What happened was that Quirinus basically wanted to look at the province of Judea and figure out how much tax revenue it was going to produce. He didn't care who came from Bethlehem or who lived in Bethlehem. He wanted to know how much money were they gonna get out of Bethlehem. So it, it wasn't a census in the way we think of it. So consequently, there'd be no need for Joseph to go there, except that they wanted to create a connection to the story of King David. Um, so furthermore, the Romans say the tech, that that census of Quirinus took place in the year 6 AD. So if Jesus was born during Herod's reign, he was already nine years old at that time, or else he was born nine or 10 years later after Herod. But anyway, let's talk about the sheep. Okay, Bend, Oregon is or was still sheep country. And if you've been around sheep herders, um, you'll know that um, sheep operations usually do one of two things with pregnant ewes. They move them into a lambing shed, the drop bin, you know, the ones that are going to give birth. Or if they're out on the open range in March, it's, they usually give birth in March or April. And uh, if you're going to be birthing your lambs out on the open range, you kind of want to adjust uh, when the ewes are impregnated so that the births will come later and have less worry of a spring blizzard or something. 
So even in the different climate of Judea, more a Mediterranean climate, winter was cold and rainy and sheep were born in the spring. And uh, since those ancient sheep herders didn't have dedicated lambing sheds, as far as we know, they, they did have to be out with the flocks to keep a close watch on the pregnant ewes to keep away predators and uh, make sure everything was going all right. Consequently, there's always been this second thread in the Christian uh, tradition that says um, that Jesus was born in the spring, plus the people who argued for that like the idea that because it ties in with his being the Lamb of God, and it ties in with the fact that he will um, be crucified during the Jewish feast of Passover, which happens in the spring. So he's a sacrifice, just as they were sacrificing actual sheep at the temple back then. So Luke's um, mention of the shepherds is the only calendrical clue in the whole story, and it points to spring. Um, but there was nothing about needing to go to your hometown to be registered. So what were the Romans doing at that time? Well, the Romans had two traditions we want to look at. One of them uh, at the winter solstice was the Saturnalia. You may have heard of that. It was, this, it was big in urban culture. Um, and of course, the more money you had, the more you could celebrate. I mean, poor people probably got by with an extra cup of wine and a cup of some figs, but rich people would celebrate on a big scale. And um, Saturn in this version was seen as the god of the golden age, the golden plant, the age of plenty when there was lots of everything. So they had feasting and they had gift giving and they had a general loosening of social restrictions. Um, and um, the same emperor Augustus, um, who was always kind of trying to micromanage Roman society, tried to keep the feast down to three days, but that wasn't very popular. Um, a British classical scholar, Mary Beard, um, says that um, there were some members, especially of the, the intellectual class, who thought it was overdone. The philosopher Seneca, she said, uh, that's about the dissipation and the fact that you can't get any public business done. You know, everything's closed. Um, the younger Pliny, another uh, writer, loftily takes himself off to the attic to get on with his work. He doesn't want to put a dampener on the slaves' fund because the slaves were allowed to party too. But more, more to the point, he doesn't want to be disturbed by the rowdiness downstairs. And don't imagine that the upstairs downstairs divide was much lessened by the carnival. There's a nice passage in Petronius Satirica where a slave steps out of line and is sharply rem reminded that it's not December. So is that the real origin of Christmas? Um, I kind of don't think so, but a little bit. I mean, there was the idea of feasting and gift giving, but that's kind of a human universal. Um, it may not have been until centuries later that we see signs of Christmas merrymaking. Um, in the early centuries, some people were still, um, saw, saw this as a fairly somber occasion, some Christians. So let's move on to the question of whether the celebration of Christmas borrows from religious Roman practice, as opposed to feasting and gift giving. The Roman Empire was a very multicultural place. And as it grew, some of the emperors wondered if it was not too diverse religiously. I mean, they had this practice of what they called interpretatio romana, which is they would, when they conquered a place, they would look at the local gods and they would say, ah, this one matches up to this one of our gods and this one matches up to this one of our gods. For example, in England, um, the famous hot springs that are today at the, in the city of Bath, uh, the Romans arrived there and said, yay, hot springs, and proceeded to build a huge temple and baths complex. Um, these had been dedicated to a Celtic goddess named Sulis. They decided that Sulis kind of matched up against their goddess Minerva, so they created the cult of Minerva Sulis and dedicated a temple to her. And that's the way they operated. But it, you know, it was getting more and more diverse. And um, there were a couple candidates for sort of universal gods. One of them you hear about is Mithras. 
um, who's sort of a savior deity, a solar deity born from a rock around the midwinter solstice. Um, the problem with the cult of Mithras, I think, is that his worship was biggest in the army and was mostly for men. And also it was big among some of the Roman upper classes, but it was um, kind of clubby. You know, it was like being a Freemason or something. It was not a big popular festival, although everybody knew about it. So if you were really deeply into it, you had to go through grades of initiation and receive new teachings. And it wasn't really family friendly. Although it did serve a purpose of unifying soldiers who came from many different countries. I mean, you might have Spanish soldiers next to what we would say today would be Syrian soldiers next to, you know, Bulgarians or something. So as the empire became officially Christian in the fourth century, to jump ahead a little bit, anti-pagan activity mounted in the fifth century, the 400s, and that's when they finally began to suppress the Mithraic religion, uh, to destroy their buildings and um, to make it pretty difficult to be a follower of Mithras. Um, so there was really no need to steal December 25th from a religion that had already been outlawed. The other candidate though, and this is the one you'll probably hear more about, is the worship of Sol Invictus, which means the unconquered sun. And clear back in the 200s, when Christianity was still very much of a minority religion, um, a bishop in Rome was saying that, um, the, that uh, Christians ought to start worshiping or feasting on December 25th because that's when the Romans around them were celebrating the, the birth of the unconquered son. This was still a century before the Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion. And even after he did that, it took another couple, another hundred years or so for it to really be, for paganism to really be suppressed. But um, the thing we got to remember is that very little of Christianity back then was codified. When Hippolytus was talking about celebrating on December 25th, it was still a century before the Council of Nicaea would decide what books belonged in the New Testament. Back then, there were lots of Gospels floating around. Um, and the liturgical calendar wasn't fixed at all. Um, there were people who were saying that the birth of the Savior occurred um, on the 20th of May in, in about the year 1 AD. Um, some people were celebrating it in January, um, according to uh, early January, about the time we would now say the Epiphany. Um, and the Coptic church, the Egyptian church, which was very influential in the Eastern Mediterranean world, um, they did drift, they did sort of settle on the December 25 date by the late fourth century, but there's some monasteries who stuck to the January 6th date which incidentally is what the Orthodox Christians today still follow, but that's because of having used a different calendar. Um, for example, one um, Eastern, Eastern writer from Syria said that the Lord was born in the month of January on the same day on which we celebrate the Epiphany. For of old, the Feast of the Nativity and the Epiphany were kept on one and the same day because on the same day he was born and baptized. The reason why our fathers changed the, solemnly celebrate, changed the solemnity celebrated on 6 January and transferred it to 25 December follows. It was the custom of the heathens to celebrate the birthday of the sun on this very day and festivities the Christians too participated in. When therefore the teachers observed that the Christians were inclined to this festival, they took counsel and decided that the true birth feast must be kept on this day. And on January 6th, we'd keep the Feast of the Epiphany. So that's um, probably as blatant a text as you'll find. And I lifted it out of the Catholic Encyclopedia um, for why um, Christmas was, quote, stolen. Okay, so... Um, 
the worship of the sun had been around for a long time. Um, and at this period, which would be about the 200s, uh, the emperors are encouraging the cult of Sol Invictus as kind of a way to religiously unify the very religiously diverse Roman Empire by sort of spreading a layer of uniformity over the top, although there was all kinds of stuff underneath. And of course, the emperor himself would be the earthly representative of the sun. Um, <clears throat> but under, underneath that, everybody could go on doing what they did. The Jews could go on being the Jews, and the Egyptians could go on being the Egyptians. Um, under the Emperor Aurelian in the 270s, the social status of Sol Invictus priests were raised. Uh, they had to be members of the senatorial class. In other words, you had to be from one of the leading families to be a priest at that, of Sol at that time. Previously, there hadn't been such a thing. Um, Constantine, the same Constantine, uh, used images of Sol Invictus on his monuments and coins. In 321, he proclaimed Sunday, the day of the sun, as an official day of rest. Previously, the Romans hadn't really had any official days of rest. They had lots of festivals. Um, and that was only three years before he endorsed Christianity. Um, some early Christians did see Sol Invictus and Jesus Christ as the same thing because later on, those particular people were denounced as heretics. Um, Tertullian, who was active in the early 200s, famous early church father, said that um, our Lord is born on the, in the month of December, the, the eighth before the Kalends of January, which would be the 25th of December, but they call it the birthday of the unconquered. Who indeed is so unconquered as our Lord? Or if they say it is the birthday of the sun, he is the son of justice. And um, the uh, famous theologian Augustine of Hippo repeated a couple hundred years later that Sol was not the Jesus God, that the Christian's God, and that it would be a heresy if you said that Sol Invictus and Jesus were the same thing. So this, um, and a century later, another one of the popes was still denouncing Christians who stood outside the door of the church on December 25th to uh, acknowledge the, the uh, rising sun on the solstice morning before they went in, they went indoors into the church service. So I guess they were just covering their bets. Um, from my point of view, the cult of Sol Invictus seems very top down. <clears throat> it was a civic religion for the empire, unifying the emperor with the sun, but it doesn't seem very cozy or family friendly. Where are the songs and the dances and the special meals for Sol Invictus? I'm not sure, I haven't really read of any. He's on coins, he's on monuments, he's mentioned in you know imperial documents, but, um, and maybe the philosophers liked it, it kind of fits with Plato's philosophy very well. And Julian, the last uh, pagan emperor who ruled in the mid 300s, uh, seems to have embraced uh, Sol Invictus as well. But then um, Julian basically liked all forms of polytheism. So the other thing that was going on back then was that um, basically Christ, uh, Christmas was not the big deal it is now. The um, important festival for Christians was Easter. And uh, it took a long time for Christianity to be, uh, for, excuse me, I keep saying that, for Christmas to become as important as Easter. Um, however, I think there's one thing that made that happen, and that was the the story of the Holy Family. Pagan celebrations of Yule often focus on family and ancestors, and the Christmas story contains one really important family story, the story of the Holy Family, and um, their tribulations, which touches us all, okay? We've all searched late at night for a motel room or a campsite, 
I mean, I remember coming into some little town in Utah. And how was I supposed to know that the high school rodeo finals for the whole state were happening right there and there wasn't a room to be had? Um, and every baby, think about this, every baby that's born, as William Wordsworth said, is the child of promise. And it comes in trailing uh, clouds of glory. And maybe strangers have given us gifts. And somewhere on the planet, you can be sure there's a little family walking down a road, or maybe they're jammed into a crowded bus, and they're fleeing agents of some government who'd like to kill them. So the idea of Joseph and Mary with the donkey, the literary donkey, and the baby Jesus walking down the road into a foreign country has appealed to people's imaginations for 2,000 years. And I think that's one of the reasons why Christmas did become so important. Um, meanwhile, um, by the Middle Ages, of course, the Roman Catholic Church, which covered all of Western and Central Europe, had settled on the dates we're used to. And festivities grew to the point where some bishops and rulers uh, thought they were getting out of, out of hand and losing the spiritual meaning of the holidays. Sound familiar? And um, the idea of Christians picking up earlier traditions of bonfires and Yule logs at the uh, season uh, upset some church leaders, but they really couldn't do anything about it. Likewise, the people were decorating their homes with greenery earlier and they continued to do it, but they just changed the story. Um, the Christmas tree um, as such probably started in Germany in the 1500s, although um, some of the Baltic countries claimed it started there. Um, as far as in the English speaking world, you've probably heard the story that uh, when young Queen Victoria married a German prince, Albert, um, he didn't bring the first Christmas tree to England. There had already been Christmas trees there, but uh, brought by other Germans, but he helped make it popular. When the royal family started having a Christmas tree, that was it. Um, but it's not really a pagan custom. In fact, uh, one pagan writer uh, recently wrote, the idea of killing an evergreen tree and decorating it at midwinter simply has no evidence to back it up um, this does not diminish the sacred symbolism of trees in paganism or the value of the practice in modern paganism. I suspect it was an old, a confl conflation of the older pagan veneration of trees and the practice of decorating with evergreen boughs with the later Christian practice of bringing in a tree and decorating it. Um, she says there's an atrocious meme going around with a festive Christmas tree picture that, that claims to explain the pagan origins of the Christmas tree. First of all, it claims that a tree was brought in so the wood spirits would be kept warm during the cold winter months. A, why would you kill a tree to do this? I mean, you basically just destroyed their home and killed the spirit of the tree. This is not how animism works. B, wood spirits living in your house is not a good idea. Seriously, there's reams of folklore on how to keep this from happening. Why on earth would you think people would do it on purpose? See, also seriously, why do wood spirits need human help to keep warm? Um, <laughs> now, also um, central to Christianity, uh, to popular Christmas, is the idea of St. Nicholas or Santa Claus. And I want to spend a few minutes on that because just like there's ideas going around about the origin of Christmas trees, there's some strange ideas going around about Santa Claus. Um, He's originally a bishop um, in what was in a Greek city in Turkey. And what's now Turkey? Um, people, people nowadays are trying to connect him with the Norse god Odin or to make him into some kind of flying shaman. You might have read that the red and white clothing he wears looks like the red and white cap of an Amanita muscaria mushroom. I'm pretty dubious about that. To begin with, uh, Nicholas, this is the, who is the patron of sailors, as well as merchants and prostitutes, which is quite an assignment. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't have any stories about flying attached to him until the 19th century. He never saw a reindeer because he lived in the Aegean Sea. Um, 
out there to connect anywhere. The red and white Santa suit that we're all used to seeing is actually created by commercial artists in the 1920s. And it was in advertisements for Coca-Cola. In other words, the red and white Santa is the red and white of the Coca-Cola label. Um, if you look at old pictures of Santa, St. Nicholas from the Victorian time or earlier, he's either A, dressed as a bishop, or he's dressed in some mishmash of different colored robes and furs and hats and all kinds of stuff. But the simple red and white Santa suit that you see at the mall is a Coca-Cola ad. That's all it is. Um, I will admit that even the New Catholic Encyclopedia is aware of the connection that some people try to make between Santa Claus and the god Odin or Woden. But they don't endorse it, neither do I. And while Odin sometimes appears as the wanderer, he is not a gift giver to good children and a punisher of bad children. St. Nicholas, the Christian bishop who lived in the Greek speaking world, um, did not fly through the air. He did once drop a bag of gold down a chimney, according to the legend but that's just because he was trying to be clandestine. He didn't go down the chimney himself. He, um, he didn't wear red and white clothing. And um, you gotta wonder, is there an archetype of a gift giving old man who shapes all these legends and poems and Coca-Cola ads and mall Santas? I think so, but I think it's gonna be kind of hard to bring it to Odin. Now, one thing that has kind of gotten edited out of the Santa Claus story in our country is that usually he used to come with sort of a dark figure, you know, Black Peter in the Netherlands or the Krampus in Central Europe. Um, so there was nice St. Nicholas and then there was the scary dark person who comes along with him and uh, dark in a, in a kind of moral sense, not a racial sense necessarily, but you know, the Krampus is sort of the wild man and um, so if, it's kind of like if you were thinking of, if you really wanted to be true to the medieval European tradition, you should imagine Santa and Bigfoot coming together. Um, it's kind of an old principle in the study of religion though, that people will do certain things for centuries and change the stories about why they do it. So the story matches the current theology, the practice is the same as it ever was. I was listening recently to a podcast um, uh, which featuring, featuring an Irish Franciscan monk named Brother Richard Hendricks, who's a really cool guy, who among other things was talking about the idea of putting a candle in the window or elsewhere on Christmas Eve. And we do that at my house. Do you do it at your house? We do that. Um, we really do. But he said there were a lot of different reasons for doing that um, that have evolved over time. One is that it's a symbolic message to the Holy Family who are on the road to Egypt or who are looking for a place to say, excuse me, they're not on the road to Egypt yet, selling them that, you know, you can find refuge here. In Ireland in the 19th century, after the big immigration started after the Great Famine, um, almost all families had relatives who had left who had gone to Canada, to America, to Australia or someplace. And so the candle on Christmas symbolized the message to those people who had gone away and would probably never be seen again because it was expensive and difficult to travel back and forth. Um, and it's also in some cases been uh, seen as a beacon, a, to wandering ancestors because there's a secondary tradition there that, you know, it's kind of like the tradition that's associated with Halloween and the pagan feast of Samhain, that the veil is thin and that it's easier to talk to the ancestors. Uh, some of that has been transferred, at least it was in Ireland in his, in his experience to the Christmas holiday. Also in Ireland, he said it was pretty common to claimed that it was easy to see the fairies on Christmas. And in fact, sometimes the fairies would be gathered around because they were cut out of the festivities. I mean, they sort of, they, they missed the fact that they couldn't participate. Okay, back at the, we started the uh, evening with a little um, clip from a, somebody's cell phone video of the drumming up the sun 
that takes place at Red Rocks Amphitheater in Denver. And uh, so I want to talk for just a few minutes about, um, as I said, what your pagan neighbors are doing. Um, my own religion is sort of a loosely American Wicca. And uh, our sacred year that we follow is not the same as what everybody does, but it's fairly common. Um, basically, we have eight major holidays, the solstices and the equinoxes and the days in between them. And it often seems that the cross quarter days, that would be uh, the beginning of November, the beginning of August, the beginning of February, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and beginning of uh, August would, uh, are more significant to us religiously than are the solstices and equinoxes. But we, um, realize that sometimes you have a double calendar going on. You have a secular celebration and you have a religious celebration. Um, I don't speak for everybody in breaking it up that way, but that's the way I've often experienced it. Today's pagans often refer to this season that we're in now as Yule, which is a pre-Christian Norse and German word. Some will say Christmas equally, um, especially for what's going on in the larger world. From what I've seen, it's a celebration primarily about community. Um, to some of us, it includes special recognition of those who've gone before, and people make sure to include the ancestors at the feast. All of the common symbols connect with our enduring lives, the evergreens, the fires, the emphasis on family ties. On the human plane, Yule is about continuity continuity with our, with our kin. Um, at the same time, um, it, it has a cosmological feeling to it too. And I want to quote here um, a guy named Stephen Posh, who's a pagan writer in Minneapolis, in Minneapolis. And he put this down recently. Christmas, as we know, has become a cannibalistic microorganism that just wants to engulf all the other holiday amoebas in the environment. Part of this, of course, is nicey nice kumbaya feel goodism. See, we're all really just alike. We all celebrate this time of year. In fact, of course, we don't. Muslims, for instance, don't have a festival of lights at this time of year, or not at all, really. Diwali, the Hindu feast in late October, early November is not really that close to Christmas. Things get a little more complicated with Yule. Pagans like to think of Yule as the mother and Christmas as the daughter festival, but that's really a pretty disingenuous reading of the relationship between the two. In fact, like it or not, our modern Yule has been reborn from the womb of Christmas and the two holidays still look a bit, a lot alike. Some of us would say too much alike. On Midwinter's Eve, we sing the sun down from the highest hill in town and kindle a fire as it sets. This fire we keep burning all night. In the morning, we sing the sun back up from the Mississippi Valley. Every year as crows call overhead and light and color stream back into the world after the year's longest night, I always think this is it. This is the real Yule in the nutshell. Let me tell you, it doesn't look anything at all like Christmas. That's his Minnesota experience. Up in Denver, about 200 of the partiest pagans usually show up before dawn on the solstice morning at Red Rocks Amphitheater, which is in the foothills southwest of Denver, but is part of that city's park system. It sits among towering sandstone rocks with a view out over the city and the high plains to the east, so that when the sun comes up, you can't miss it. People arrive around 6.30 a.m. with a variety of hand drums, borans, dumbbacks, etc., and other rhythm instruments and flutes and whatnot. And they play continuously <clears throat> as the sun peeps over the horizon and emerges. You might see some fire spinners and such like as well. Drumming up the sun has been a Denver tradition for at least 30 years and Westward, which is the weekly alternative newspaper up there now listed as one of, quote, 10 ways to celebrate the winter solstice in Colorado. Now me, I live a long way from Denver. So I usually just take my boron, whistle up the dogs 
and climb a ridge up behind the house for a solo ritual. Oddly enough, I'm walking on the same red sandstone as the fountain formation, only it's out of sight under my feet. Um, we pagans say we participate in the solstice. A lot of our language is about participation and about relationship. We celebrate our place on the turning wheel of the seasons and on the turning earth. We know the cycle will continue longer than we can imagine. And we play our parts over and over, giving and receiving. We celebrate our survival as individuals and as a culture because we never went away. We also realize we draw on a common cultural vocabulary, lights, children, family, holly, um, the ivy. Um, last night, the BBC had a segment on a British music teacher who wrote a new Christmas song, which was being sung by young children holding candles. Well, there you are, some of the most common elements of the solstice season. Um, I want to end up with a little poem by another pagan writer, Melissa Hill, who was thinking about the idea of, of sacrifice, not in the sense so much of blood even, but in the sense of, you know, just giving back to acknowledge what you're getting. And she, she had some questions that had been bouncing around in her mind, like how and what do you sacrifice for others? What do others sacrifice for you? How could you be more compassionate and giving? What gifts could you be giving the world this year? So she came, to, this poem came to her and it was, she called it the deer that holds the sun in its antlers. It runs. The fleeing deer whose heart is shaped as the crescent moon, it leaps. The sacred deer racing through the mountains to the highest peak. The holy deer races from the hunter's hunger, pursued in the winter darkness, holding the light in its, in its tines. Will the hunter catch it? Will the darkness hold? Will the hunter's stars be king of both day and night? It reaches the peak, it leaps and is caught as the light ascends to the sky, sacrifice. The spear strikes true and the hunter has won his prey, but still the light ascends on the darkest day. The holy deer walks wounded, the sacred deer is hunter's meat. Life given, life taken and life continued again. The soul of the sun is free. The darkness begins to wane, sun strengthened by sacrifice's gift. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions that came up. Uh, if you don't mind. No, I'm happy to take questions. Great. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your personal experiences around this time of year? Are there specific rituals or traditions that you like to celebrate? Uh, you mentioned that you put the candle in the window. <laughs> Is there anything else that you, in particular, that you came from your family or uh, that you just like to do around this time of year? Well, um, certainly I grew up with all this standard American um, Christmas rituals. Um, and um, although I've been a capital P pagan since I turned 21, I was raised in the Episcopal Church where we had an Advent wreaths and so all that sense of anticipation and you know, uh, midnight Eucharist and all that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I think what matters to me now though, uh, first of all is, as I say, community, um, just celebrating the strength of our community, the pagan community. And secondly, the, um, the going out, what the, what the drumming up of the sun says basically, which is that um, we are all part of this bigger thing. And we're not escaping it. We're not here to escape from it. We're here to live in some kind of relationship with it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's beautiful. How did your study really begin? Uh, you just mentioned that you really became a capital P pagan at the age of 21. But was there a singular event that prompted your interest? Or how did it, how did your study begin? Okay, well, um, yeah, this, would, this is a typical story of pre-internet paganism, <laughs> which honestly was, um, I was living outside of Taos, New Mexico. I was working on a construction job between my junior and senior years at Reed College in Portland. Um, and I um, 
at that point in my life was sort of what you might call a seeker. You know, I was investigating lots of different things. And I had never found a spiritual path that allowed me to integrate everything. You know, um, I didn't want to be a monk, you know, Christian Buddhist or any other kind of monk. Um, <laughs> I, and it seemed that so many of the spiritual teachers I encountered would always be saying about, well, you've got to, you know, you've got to give up something, you know, like I was really into poetry back then, um, almost went for a master of fine arts and, um, I didn't know where that would fit in. <clears throat> I was also a Western kid. I'd grown up hunting and fishing. My father was a forest ranger. I didn't know how that fit in because that was always probably my, part of my problem with Christianity as I experienced it was that <clears throat> it seemed to end at the edge of town. Mm. And uh, there was never an adequate explanation for how we live with all these other nations, you know, like the <clears throat> um, white-breasted nuthatch nation, let's say. And um, when I discovered at first through reading that um, there could still be a form of modern paganism, I was in. I didn't know anyone else. I didn't know if there were any others. Um, it took me about two years to meet anybody. And again, I said, this is pre-internet. And besides, I was busy being a college student. Um, but, you know, eventually one thing led to another. And uh, um, and, you know, I never, I never looked back. Mm -hmm. That's great. It sounds like you found something that resonated on all levels and that was it. So mm -hmm. this is uh, kind of a fun question and it's really just your expert opinion on this. <laughs> you mentioned earlier the wood sprites that might be kept warm by somebody bringing in a Christmas tree okay. and keeping right. them. These wood sprites would these possibly be the origins of Santa's elves? Or do you know of any other origin to Santa's elves? I don't know. Here again, <clears throat> certainly, you know, we have lots of tradition about um, other forms of life. Um, be they local spirits, fairies, what have you. Um, I think the idea of Santa making toys for little children and thereby needing a workforce is a pretty new idea in, the, in terms of the history of the story of St. Nicholas. Um, because, um, you know, it's only sort of in the Victorian period of the Industrial Revolution that um, toys become mass produced and mm. relatively cheap. <laughs> You know, I mean, before then, I'm sure most children didn't get a sack, you know, a bunch of boxed up toys. They were probably lucky to get a pair of socks and a piece of fruit or something. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know. I think that, you know, you, there's been a lot of research done on um, the way people have um, conceptualized this other realm. Um, the secret commonwealth, as uh, one famous writer on the fairy world put it. And uh, the idea of Santa's elves probably tie into the way in which fairies, for example, became sort of smaller and cutesier over the centuries, especially mm -hmm. in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. From being big, fairly scary people to <laughs> you know, these little things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, this has been such a treat. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Chaz. We really appreciate your uh, expert look into the enmeshment of so many different traditions. 
into this big season that we like to call the holidays. Yeah. Uh, we want to say thank you to everyone else who joined us tonight. It has been wonderful spending this time with you. We invite you to go to deschutzlibrary.org and check out all of our great fun free programs all throughout the month. Uh, we have a lot of content on there and we would love to have see you again soon. So we hope that you have a very happy holidays and we'll see you again shortly. Thanks, Chaz. Have a good Thank night, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.